Sovereign in the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor, with me in the calm, you with me in the storm. Sovereign in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, you with me at the dawn. In your everlasting arms all the pieces of my life from beginning to the end I can trust you in your never failing love you work everything for good Lord whatever comes my way I will trust you Lord whatever comes my way I will trust you Lord Sovereign in the mountain air Sovereign on the ocean floor With me in the calm You with me in the storm Sovereign in my greatest joy Sovereign in my deepest cry With me in the dark You with me at the dawn Everlasting arms, all the pieces of my life from beginning to the end. I can trust you in your never failing love. You work everything for good, Lord. Whatever comes my way, I can trust you, Lord. Whatever comes my way I can trust you Lord I do trust you Lord Amen The strength within the sorrow There's beauty in our tears And you meet us in the morning With the love that cast out fears working in our waiting glorifying us and with love and understanding you're teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper by love begotten us, be with us in the fire and the flood. Oh, you're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign, Lord, through us. You are wisdom unimagined. Now understand your ways, reigning high in our heaven, reaching out in endless grace. You're the lifter of the lonely. Compassionate and kind 
you surround and you uphold me with the love for all mankind your plans are still the prosper by love begotten us you with us in the fire and the flood oh you're faithful forever so perfect in love you are sovereign lord through us your plans are still to prosper by love begotten us you with us in the fire and the flood oh you're faithful forever so perfect in love you are sovereign lord through us you are sovereign lord through us Good morning, everyone. Oh, come back here. You know, I won't do that. There's a song I had prepared, but I think it's a little bit too early. It has to do with pebbles and I mean, but I think I'll wait because I don't feel like crying. So, <laughs> so I'll wait. <laughs> Yes, that's it. Yeah. She's healed now. Yep. That is the ultimate healing. And uh, there's no time over there, so she's sitting at the door in the rug barking, barking. we know you guys across through the door yeah <laughs> and to her you already have so yep that, yeah we'll we want to do that one she's with boaz and yeah. rookie and yeah. you remember rookie yeah i remember you talking about rookie yeah you you were out at the house though. yeah i don't remember it though yeah no. you and eric came there a couple mm -hmm. times you had rookie then yeah Okay. She liked you. She kind of didn't like Eric. <laughs> Not too many people liked Eric. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't like uh, well. There's a couple she didn't like. <laughs> I'll leave. I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Thank you. I 
today. Um, just a lot going on over the last couple of weeks, and I couldn't wrap my mind around anything to to just sit down and really, really think on it. Uh, if somebody was looking for a presentation, I'm sorry about that, but we'll have a good time today. Um, we're going to just discuss um, whatever comes on our heart, discussion, dialogue, and um, just have a good time. And um, as we know, I, th I think I put it on, yeah, I did put it on Facebook, but um, Honey had, had uh, crossed the veil and passed away, our little, the little yellow dog. And um, so she's, uh, she's still with us. Um, that's the one great thing about what Jesus said you know, for humanity, it's I and you and you and me, so she's living in us, and um, she's, like Alan said, she's, uh, she's right with us, and, yep, <laughs> so, um, the, the broadcast doesn't have a, um, we don't have to switch it back and forth on the computer today, so it can set just like that. We don't have to move it in and out or anything. That's good enough. You can kind of identify whoever's talking, and, and we'll just leave it right there. And and uh, if it's not loud enough, somebody on the, on the broadcast, if you want to tell us that, I will know to go over there and turn it up just a little bit. Um, and Alan and Daniel and... Connie and different ones will be watching, but we're just going to discuss discuss a few things, and it's good to see everyone here, and Sister Denise and Josiah and Jacob came in. Did Daryl make it, or? Okay. Yeah, he told me, he told me yesterday that he had, he said he, I forget, he said he dropped something on his head, and, uh, and, and then uh, twisted his knee and something else during it. He said, I think I'm getting old. <laughs> I said, nah, you got, you got two kids and Denise. I said, hey, you're going to have to stick around a while. Ain't no getting old yet. <laughs> so, um, so we'll, uh, We'll talk just a little bit this morning on different things, and I wrote a few things down that were questions that have been sent to me, and I haven't gotten to them yet, but we'll start out just uh, uh, kind of discussing what we were discussing last week, and I had one slide left, and that was epiphany. Um, we went through epigenetics, epikinesis epikinetics and we were on a epiphany and I just stopped because it was getting so late but as you know an epiphany is an awakening <clears throat> so that's the that's the final phase of that line of markers and thoughts and seals and you can call it so many things inside you um, science has called it epigenetics and they've just uh, like Brother Kit told me, he said, you know, I went looking for these things on the on the Internet, and he said, you can't find anything on it hardly. And he said, they're still unsure about it. 
And that's why I said right up front, I said, if you go out there on the Internet trying to look for these things, you're not going to hear a lot about what we're saying because we are bringing that science that is just now being discovered into, into our spirituality. And um, epigenetics, of course, is your genes, your DNA, your cells, everything that makes up the genes. And then the, when you take those genes and bring them uh, in a string together, Though it becomes genetics, and those genetics um, are linked with the epigenetics and and uh, epigenetics. They're linked inside uh, chromatones, and science calls it all that. But here's what I call it: <laughs> under the spiritual side, I believe science. I believe every bit of it. But our terms will run, and spiritually speaking, we have within us the Holy Spirit, and that is the epa. That's what's over it all. And that's what, uh, it's our human spirit, and it deals in us, and it lives in us, and it is the Holy Spirit uh, progressing itself and becoming wiser, sharper, smarter, more intellectual, but at the same time, much, much, much more spiritual, um, because what we created was created for us to learn, for us to understand, for us to be able to use um, these things to relate to our intellect, to relate to what we knew logically. The word logic comes from logos. What we knew when we were living in the logos, we created this so we could get the feeling and emotion and understanding of everything that we knew. So... This is the epiphany. Somebody said, I had an epiphany. Um, this is the epiphany. We're living in it. This is the awakening. And um, it happens to us every day. Um, when, you, when you learn something new, when you pick up an understanding on something, when you progress on something, it is an epiphany. It is an awakening. It's a, it's a coming to an understanding. For instance... Um, I was a little boy one time, and I didn't know how to put my coat on. And uh, I remember uh, my mom put it on me the first few times, but the first time I tried, I put the arms in. You know, I just shoved my arms in there, and I thought, now, how am I going to zip this up, you know? <laughs> I couldn't reach it or anything else, and, and, and uh, I finally got the coordination to where today I just throw my coat on. But when I learned how to put my coat on, I know that's kind of a crude example, but that's an epiphany. It's an awakening. I'm like, hey, I know how to do that myself. Boy, tying the shoes, that was something else for me. I don't know if y'all, some kids, I don't think, know how to tie them today. And they're grown up. They're 25 years old walking around with their shoes untied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that was, a, that was fun, learning how and tying everything in knots and getting the knots so tight that, you know, you'd get a slap from your mom, and and then she would take scissors and everything else and just stick them in there and pull them apart. And <laughs> but I had an epiphany. I learned how to tie my own shoes. Um, and then you come to the spiritual side, of course, and there are epiphanies. We came through justification. We came through sanctification. We came through the restoration of gifts and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We came through... Uh, thinking that our soul was the only thing that's going to be saved, and then we came through and realized that that soul is just the nature of the spirit. The spirit's what is eternal, and then we came through and found out that that um, we're taking our body with us. So we we come through these epiphanies and we keep waking up to them. So that was what was pretty much left on that whole line of thought, and uh, I'm sure we'll still be looking at some of it because I do want to bring in. The, the physical and the spiritual resurrection because everybody says I've had a spiritual resurrection I'm waiting on the physical well, I'm not I've had a spiritual resurrection and the physical resurrection is a part of that spiritual resurrection so um, they're one and I put some a few little things out about Elijah and, and Elisha on it just to kind of break the ice and get people to thinking, well, is he trying to say the physical and spiritual are both one? And 
and uh, and then we'll go from there and show how it is. But um, I told Brother Allen and Brother Daniel, I said, today we'll just kind of have a, and uh, Sister Connie and uh, different ones I wrote, and said, we'll just kind of have an open discussion today. Um, my mind's just been on some things that, that have happened and with my wife and my my pup, you know, a dog is, uh, they say, is a man's best friend, and and uh, it's true in a lot of ways. It's true in a lot of ways. Um, I had one guy wrote on the, on the, uh, when I posted that our pup had passed, and uh, I said we loved it, and different ones were ta saying, you know, they loved, they seen it, and they loved it, and this and that, and one of them wrote and said, uh, I deleted it. But he said, isn't this just exactly what Brother Branham said? You humans would begin to love dogs more than you love humans. And and uh, you'd start treating dogs like your children, and you wouldn't want to have your own babies. And and uh, I read it, and I thought, I wish I could run into you for about 15 <laughs> seconds right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it wouldn't be words. <laughs> yeah, but I just thought. You know what? I'm not going to get into this. Delete. And I just moved on. But um, we'll, have some, uh, we'll, we'll have some good discussion here today and, and uh, open discussion. So um, I know you guys have been thinking about a few of the things we've been talking about and maybe something totally different. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, sisters, any, anybody, if you have something... Um, to start the discussion off with, feel free to. The person that put that on your website, uh, on the uh, Facebook, you know, that person did exactly what they were accusing you of doing, putting your dog first above humans. Well, this person goes on your Facebook page where you're talking about the passing of your dog and everyone's posting positive, comforting things. And what does he do? He reverts back to the passing of the dog as if it was a negative thing. So he put that negative passing above the human nature of everyone comforting you yeah. with all that was going on. Now, what kind of spirit would do that? Yeah. What kind of spirit would criticize you on that forum and put the, the death of an animal above everyone's human spirit that's comforting you? Yeah. That person is a dog. <laughs> <laughs> We have to understand that there are many people, the majority of the planet, that are still every thought, every action, every word that comes out of their mouth either runs through religion or politics. You're right. They cannot think outside those parameters because they have been indoctrinated to believe that the whole world runs off those two things, those two platforms. And we have stepped beyond that veil and realized those are dead. Those were processes that we yes. needed to apply because we are limitless beings and politics and religion will limit you. Yeah. It will separate, it will confine you, and that's why we use those to test ourselves. Yes. Now, we've gotten past that, but there are many out there, every thought, is either connected through both religion and politics or one or the other. Yes. They just they can't help they it. They can't do it. They can else. they've not crossed that veil and until they do, until they wake up to that, there's n delete it and move on. There's no point in even responding to it because it's like sh like brother Branham says like stopping and shaking your finger at a rattlesnake that's rattling there's no point to it. Just walk away. Just move walk on. Away. That's yeah. right. Yep. You are exactly right. Religion and politics. I've seen a, something that a brother, I really like him. I've never met him, but I'm, except for on Facebook, it was Brother uh, John Crawford. If you can pull him up and get him as a friend, he really has some great things to say. But, you know, he, was, uh, he, he had a little thing that said, there's never been, I'm, I'm just going to quote it the best I can, there's never been, 
uh, as much slaughtering, murdering, and killing in such a cheerful manner as there has been through politics and religion. <laughs> they never do it so cheerfully. They think they're doing it. Jesus said they will kill you thinking they are doing service for the Lord. So a lot of people do that, and a lot of governments do that. And, you know, we're watching, uh, we're watching some of the governments across the earth right now um, who are moving more to that um, it's really a veiled um, dictatorship. They call it socialism, but it's a veiled dictatorship. And if you say, well, did Brother Branham say that? Yes, he did. He, in, in Feast of the Trumpets, he said, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was our first dictator and many more to come. So we're sitting under... He didn't say many more in the United States to come, but he said many more to come. And look at everything that rose up across Africa and then rose up across South America and is raising up in South America now. And look at what they're trying to raise up in the United States. I guarantee you if they try to move it into socialism, it'll move into an oligarchy, and just within no time it will move into a dictatorship because uh, the minute you go by popular vote, which they are going to try to do. The minute you go by popular vote, then whoever has the population fearing them the most is the one that gets in. And uh, then, it, then it really becomes. But that's, uh, and Brother Branham said that that dictatorship in the Feast of the Trumpets, that dictatorship which um, was in a political and military realm he said it will move into an ecclesiastical realm. Well, look at religion today um, and look at what they're doing, and it's in an ecclesiastical realm, and it's dictatorships. If you don't believe what they believe, then, uh, then you know, they're going to they're gonna lord over you. They're going to, uh, they're going to find a way to... Uh, extinguish you if they can i wrote something down here um and you guys if you want to talk on this for just a minute this is a this is something that kept coming up does and it kind of blends in it's a segue does everyone have to participate in a circle fellowship by changing their style in their church services and also by everyone must speak And that, that's a question that came in. It's been laying here, and I've been thinking about it, and I thought, well, today would be a good day to talk a little bit about it. You know, we did that. We changed it to just a, you know, we're sitting around in a fellowship. I don't care if it's a circle, a square, or, a, or a <laughs> whatever. But we're having fellowship, one with another. And circle sounds good. That's a nice term, circle fellowship. Um. But the question is, does everyone need to participate in changing up their service and having circle fellowship, and then everyone must speak? And if everyone doesn't speak, then, uh, then people are being left out. And there's even some that say, well, the men speak, but the women don't. And, uh, you know, so that's the, the, that's the concept be bold and say it there's no more church church is over church is over any th that question and i'm not putting down whoever had it i, I want no. them to think about their question that question has a religious basis it does conduct order and doctrine you're trying to ask a question about if we reform our church in a different way how should we do that forget it Church right. is over. It's done. It's finished. Don't think of it as church. We are through with church. We are through with religion. We are here for fellowship. Because through that common fellowship is the only way that all the little differences are going to get smoothed out and we can live in harmony. There ain't no other way it's going to work. That's right. 
there, I could say it like this. There's, there's no deacon sitting in here. There's no pastor sitting in here. There's no, there's no prophet sitting in here. When we come in here, we are in here to fellowship together. And we're not, yes, there are people with spiritual gifts that we want them to use them. Alan has a spiritual gift. We want him to use it. Daniel has, every one of us have spiritual gifts. I have them. Our sisters have, and we want you to use them. We want you to feel free to use them, but we don't want you to feel like you must use them or you have uh, failed in the fellowship. No, we don't want to feel that way at all. We want it to be spontaneous. We want to come together as fellowship, one with another, and I can learn just as much from Daniel or Denise or Josiah as I can from myself or anyone else. You follow the flow of the Spirit in your area, for your group, for your people. Just follow the flow of the Spirit. The flow of the Spirit says, let's get in a circle and just talk. Let's get in a circle and talk. If the flow of the Spirit says, well, I'm a pastor, I'm going to stand in the pulpit, and I'm going to look down and talk to all of you, then do it. But follow the flow of the Spirit. Daniel's right. There is no church. There's no more organizational structure anymore. Just follow the flow of the Spirit. When you change things... And you were the pastor of the group, and the spirit through you decided we need to change, and you brought us to this. Now, we're at this circle. I know, Daniel knows, Connie knows, Denise knows. If either one of us have a PowerPoint presentation or something we want to talk about, we can sit down here and do it. Yep. It didn't have to be you all the time. Yep. We could sit down and do it. So it's the flow of the spirit is fellowship. It's not, I mean, think of, of Christ back in the day. He didn't sit down and organize church and organize structure. He talked to the people. He fellowship yeah. with them. That's right. It's all about fellowship. That leads to someone on Facebook had posted a question. Uh, if I'm a Christian, do I have to go to church? And I thought, for one, <laughs> you know, like you said, there is no church. But thinking of their structure and how they organize things, I thought, you know, Christian, the term is to be Christ-like. It's a term, to be Christ-like. Yeah. Now, Jesus' last name was not Christ. <laughs> so Christ is a, an anointing, let's put it that way. So to be that, we've gone beyond being like that anointing. We are that anointing. We yeah. are Christ. Yeah. So to, I was thinking about that question, uh, do I have to go to church? Go to fellowship. Yeah. Just go and enjoy con company. It's that artesian yeah. well flowing it's, Exactly. Out. And, that's, and a good example of that is Sister Norrock. She goes around to different organizations because she's enjoying fellowship. Yeah. And it's a church or a structure, but she's enjoying fellowship. Yes. She is Christ enjoying people. Amen. Amen. And that's what it's about. And, you know, when we change this up, um, a lot of different people have gone to what we would term circle fellowship. Many, many, many have gone to that. And that's fine. If you felt led to do that for your area, Alan is exactly right. There are some areas where the pastor or the leader or the guide or the facilitator, whatever you want to call him, he hasn't felt like doing that. And who am I to sit here in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and say, well, you're not a part of, of this revelation that we have because you're still using this or this or this. Use anything, whatever helps your people in your local area understand through the spirit and do that if it means standing up you know i used to because i had a bunch of uh, managers in a plant down in uh, in louisiana and i'll just be honest with you they were lazy and and so we go into a morning meeting and i had chairs all around the table and They'd come in, they'd sit down, and good Lord, it'd be two or three hours before we got out of there. Them giving reports and telling this happened and that happened. And so one day they came in the room, and there was no chairs. I took them all out, and we had a table there, and I said, we'll just stand around the table. And each meeting took about 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I changed it up to get a better flow to get them back out there on the floor, to still get your reports. But it wasn't all this 
uh, frivolous frock uh, pl playing around and and doing everything else, trying to use up some time to where they they didn't have to uh, be out there with the guys on the floor and the ladies. So I changed that up. Of course, the whole plant, they was laughing about it and said, boy, you fixed that meeting real good. <laughs> do what you need to do to bring in the flow of the Spirit and get out what you need to get out of everything. Every time you try to create a situation and organize a teaching, that type of, of thought, realize where it takes you. It puts you in a position to where one person is teaching and everyone else is having to learn. And if that person is not you, that person cannot teach you anything. Yeah. You're not going to learn from somebody else. You're going to learn from yourself. It's that voice inside of you yes. that gives the answers that you need to the questions in your life. So when you move that aside, for example, I remember some of the most powerful meetings, gatherings that I've ever been in has been me and Don and Connie sitting around right that fire there. at 1 o'clock in the morning on a Friday night or you know, and some of the things that opened up that we saw that transpired went so much more in detail and so much deeper than what we did here at a meeting, yeah. an organized meeting. Yeah. So don't put the emphasis on the structure. Put the emphasis on the desire to share what's inside of you because in doing that, that's what's going to trigger the answers that you that's need. That's right. That's right. When I went to Africa... Uh, we were already doing our fellowships here uh, the way that we do them. And uh, when I went to Africa, you know, there were hundreds of people. So you kind of, you still stood up in the formal, got behind a pulpit. And, and um, you know, I, it didn't bother me a bit. And one of, the, one of the ministers even asked me, he said, are you okay with this? I said, sure, I'm okay with it. You, know, you don't have to do what I do. Um, and so we had a great time. When I went to the Philippines this last time, we had special meetings where four, five, six churches come together and, and can't hardly uh, set so many hundreds of people in a circle. <laughs> so, you know, I'd get behind a pulpit and I would talk and then brother marion talked and brother jamie talked and brother joe and all the different ones and we had a good time and uh so it does everyone have to speak well i will just say this if you've got something on your heart that you know the holy spirit wants you to speak that you know i uh, say holy spirit that it's burning inside you you know that that it will help please don't just sit there bring it out and and we will enjoy it um but if you're gonna any one of us if you're gonna talk just so you can say well i participated it's not gonna do much it's not gonna help much so when you're in these meetings here or anywhere else when you're in fellowship one with another pay attention to what comes to your mind does it flow is it is it understandable are all of those things happening for us in a manner that that when i bring this up it's going to be fellowship and not uh dictation or or some kind of um you know teaching but more of a a just enjoying the fellowship one with another so no you do not have to set your um, assembly, your gatherings, your fellowships. You don't have to. I don't have a conduct order and doctrine book. There's no CODs. There's no. I have sat down by the creek and talked to people. I stood on on ocean shores and preached in the middle of the night with bonfires. I say preached. Um, people asking questions and us going back and forth. We've had great fellowship. Um, in every way that you can think of. So 
you know, if you want to go down by the seashore and do it, go down by the seashore and do it. If you want to have it on a back porch, go to your back porch and do it. Whatever you want to do. If you want to meet somebody down here at McDonald's and sit in a corner and talk, feel free to do it. It's, it's all the same fellowship, every bit of it. Church is over. Um, this is an awakening time. The word church means called out. We're not calling people out from the world anymore. What we are doing is waking them up to the world that they live in because it's theirs. This is ours. We're not going anywhere. Amen. So I think we all understand that now. <laughs> um, if you if you hear that question, feel free. You know, when we're sometimes I don't answer a question on Facebook. Because I just wait. I want to see if somebody else is going to answer it. Um, sooner or later I do if it doesn't get answered. But I'd like to see other people fellowship in the things that they that they believe. So is there any any other thoughts that some of you had kind of brought with you? You know, we had talked about this. A lot of times after the service and after the uh, broadcast turned off, we sit and eat, and we have a lot of conversation. Well, this is one of the topics that we talked about, and I thought, you know, I wish we'd have done this on, on the broadcast. But anyway, purpose for the cross, purpose for salvation. Since there is no sin and there is no one loss, um, remember that topic we were talking about? Mm. Um, sacrifices and all that what was the purpose of all the sacrifices what a purpose what is the purpose for the cross and for salvation when there's no sin and no one loss so yeah. if we could talk about that again okay what is the purpose of the crucifixion if there's no sin to begin with and sin was just an illusion um, what was really the purpose of the crucifixion? That's a good question. What do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it depends on who you're asking the question to. I think if you ask the question to, to people 2,000 years ago in the city of Jerusalem, the response you would get would be completely different than if you asked a group of people here in the United States right now. Why? Yes. Because back then, that was the focal point of the spirit. What transpired needed to take place. Now, we can look at it now, all these years later, and we have a certain understanding. But keep in mind, we don't have a full understanding. We have a 2,000-year-old understanding. We have an awakening of 2,000 years later. Yeah. But there's more to come. There's more of this that will unfold itself. So now keep in mind that when you give an answer like that to a question like that, you, what you're doing is you're saying, how, how did we define limits on something that's limitless? Yes. Why do we take something that really isn't needed, but it had to be there and, and we had to use it? So how did we need it? Why did we need it at that particular time? Yeah. I think that kind of refocuses the question a little bit and just yeah. because for me now when I, I don't even look back at it anymore. Mm -hmm. it, I don't need to keep looking back at Jesus and the cross and, and, and all these things because they're not applicable to my everyday life. That's religion. That's religion. It's just it just doesn't fit in. It, it's not applicable. I can't find it in my life every single day. I just can't do it. Yeah. But I realized for a lot of people who sit around and have questions, they're like, okay, so maybe it doesn't really apply, but why? Well, what was the point? And I understand that curiosity. So I think it's a really good question. Yeah. But I, for me, I just keep it in the perspective that that's more about religion. And we can look into that. But remember that that subject's already finished. Yes. But for a lot of people, it's not. I realize that. When we talk about there's a lot of people out there, they're oh. standing right there at the veil. That's right. And they can see the veil as clear as they can see it, but understanding they can't see everything on the other side yet. 
So they're asking questions like this. Why? Because they're trying to get through the veil. Yes, that's true. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know the church order, the order, you know, the blood sacrifice had to be a human blood sacrifice, not an animal anymore. So it had to be a human blood sacrifice. But for me, the whole picture of the crucifixion is all about the resurrection. The whole thing to me was about the resurrection. There's been others that got up out of the dead that someone brought them forth, or the witch brought Samuel forth, or Jesus told Lazarus to come forth. No one got themselves up out of the grave until Christ came to show that death, sin, none of it had an effect anymore on any of our lives. I got myself up to show that you can get yourself up out of your death, out of your sin nature that you're living in now and come to life, come to eternal life like I have. Jesus showed himself to everyone. To me, the whole story about the crucifixion was all about the resurrection. That was the point of the crucifixion to me. Okay. So the crucifixion was looking to the resurrection. Okay. For me, when I look at it, um, the crucifixion, okay, started out all the way back in Adam's day in Genesis, the third chapter, when there was a prophecy given that there would come one who would, um, their seed, his seed would be um, crossed against Cain's seed, against all seed of man. It would be, it would, uh, it would give itself. So that prophecy came, and then it came down to, and, it's, and Paul even writes and says, all of those people um, from Adam to Christ, or to Mo Adam to Moses, he said, they um, followed after the similitude of Adam's transgression. In other words, they didn't have a transgression, but they followed after the similitude, or they were represented by Adam. So as we come down through time, man more and more and more condemned himself over what happened with Adam. Then, boom, here comes Moses, and he writes all of this illusionary sacrifice animals. And Because when Moses came and he began to write all these things, the people were at a point that they did not feel. They were so condemned over sin and everything else. When Moses wrote what he wrote, they didn't feel that they could contact God. So, and that's what they called it. Moses called it God, you know, and all the way down through. Now, when we get down to Jesus Christ, and he was crucified, he, he came to be crucified at the time when sin, the illusion of sin had taken us into its deepest depths. Rome was ruling, Greek had their, Greece had all of their intellect, everybody, and, and Israel was, blood was flowing through the streets, every sacrifice or every festival, and I mean, we were right at the depths. And Jesus said, you know, because humanity thought in its mind the only way to get rid of sin was to have a substitute. An animal substitute, Moses already said, wasn't good enough. So everybody felt horrible even after they sacrificed their doves and their cows and their bullocks and their everything else. They still felt horrible. They still felt condemned. And Jesus came to break that illusionary condemnation, that illusionary thought of what sin is. Nobody had any sin, but Jesus had to break that illusion. And so when he died on Calvary, what he did was he took the place and became a substitute, whereas the animals used to be a substitute. Jesus became a substitute. And when he became a substitute, everybody started saying, I can accept Jesus, and therefore my sin is gone. What did he do? Jesus put on bloody garments just like the animals 
had and wore those bloody garments to create mediation, intercession, intercessory, um, propitiation, forgiveness, um, grace. He created, he did that on Calvary to create those concepts. And then we come through 2,000 years of those concepts, all of that mediation, intercessory, propitiation, uh, I need Jesus, I, I got to be saved, I got to be this, I got, we came through and we had a mediator up there uh, blessing us and giving us a connection to, quote, God up there somewhere. And so we came through 2,000 years of church ages in that. And then Jesus came back again, or Moses and Elijah came back again, or Christ came back again in William Branham, and he preached souls in prison, the token. He come across all of those messages, future home, unveiling of God, Christ revealed in his own word. And Brother Branham said, the substitute is over. There's no more mediation. The breach in the seals, the seventh seal, there's no more mediation. What had happened? Finally, we had come to the point that the illusion of sin could be totally lifted. He didn't die for sin. He died for the illusion of sin that was on our backs so he could remove the condemnation. Now, we accepted him as a substitute, but now we are. It's us. We are. There's no substitute. There's no, there's no um, something out here that we reach out and grab. We are the Christ. We are the Jesus. We are, we are all those things, and we don't need a substitute anymore because I realize I have no sin. I don't need bloodshed anymore. I needed the bloodshed to get me out of the illusion. But once I'm out of the illusion, I say, you know, I know there's still people that need to come out of the illusion, and they need Jesus. But for me, I'm out of it. I, I got no issues with sin. I don't. I have no sin. Um, I am totally out of the illusion of sin. I ran under the law of Moses for a while. I ran under the mediation of Jesus for a while. Now I understand who I am. I am the Christ myself. And I think that's uh, all three of these things that we've talked about kind of match in together. Unless there's a falling away first, then there's no awakening. That's right. Contrast. Yeah. You have to have the falling away the first. The law has to fall away. The condemnation has to fall away. All those things have to fall away. That's right. And we have let those things, like chains, fall off of us and so you know when when i hear the message people and they're out here and they're talking about all of this sin um message group and third testament group all this sin we still have and we're not totally redeemed yet and they're they're still laying back here under the law and they are using us whether the substitute is animals which the Jewish people use, or whether the substitute is Jesus. Um, they're playing with substitutes. We are not. We're past all the substitutes. Amen. Anything else that uh, that you brought with you that you wanted to add? I just brought these little things to, in case you, we needed them even a little bit to go pick up Aubrey. But um, watching TV, I, I heard someone say this, and I thought, ooh, that was good. So I rewound it. I said, did I hear what I thought I heard? I listened to it again. I thought, that was really good. So I wrote it down. It said, humans are social animals. When we are born, we are a blank slate. And over the course of our lives, we expand and grow as a result of external stimuli. Every single one of us is shaped by the totality of our relationships. People we love, people we hate, all make their mark. And I thought, that is a good understanding of the phrase, eternal life is what you do for others. 
Yeah, it is. Amen. Amen. It's that's a holistic view. Instead of having a one view, one way, you got to be this or else. You're all things, and sometimes, um, you know, I could have done better, but I learned a lesson. And you got to learn lessons just like you learn blessings. <laughs> Amen. Just doing different. That's right. We have to watch when we talk to ourselves. We have to listen to what we're saying because your terminology will become habitual. And you'll start thinking in a pattern to where you're limiting yourself. I never even compare myself. Well, I could have done that better. I could have done that. I just think, you know what? I could have done different, and I different. got. A, I would have gotten a different result. And it might have been that that result would have been more progressive and productive for me. And the one I chose slowed me down. Or it might have been looking at them that actually the one I made, as rough as it was, got me through it quicker. Yeah. You know? And I learned a lot more. I learned a lot more. So I've gotten to the point where I never look at anything on a scale of balance versus the old scale. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's a pendulum. Your main focus is in the center. Your extremes are out on the side, but the center is the focal point. We used to weigh everything out to where one side had to be more than the other. Yes. When you stop thinking like that, you will quit comparing yourself to others and other situations. You'll quit doing that. Yes. And what that will do is it will allow you to stand still and be very quiet and discover who you really are. Amen. Amen. When I heard this saying and I wrote it down, I thought, you know, when we're born, we're blank, blank slate. And everything in our lives, Jacob, Josiah, as they grow up, um, they grow as a result of external stimuli, as a result of their parents and what they instill in their yeah. kids. So every single one of them, your know, kids, all of us, are shaped by the totality of our relationships with others. Now it gets to a point where okay, I'm shaped in this manner, I grew up under this household, now I realize who I am, and I have to make a decision of what I want to be. Yeah. So at some point, that external stimulus that made me who I am will change to who I want to be. And then there'll be other relationships that'll help mold me to who I want to be. Um, and everyone yeah. leaves their mark, everyone is involved in my decision of what I want to do with my life whether it's wife, kids, or whatever, homosexual, whatever anyone wants to do, they are creating their reality and their life based on their desire to fulfill their life. And external stimulus or relationships yeah. help mold that wherever they go. But you come to a point where you have to stand on your own two feet and say, okay, this is who I am. Now what do I want to be? What do right. I want to do? Amen. I look at, for me, external stimulation is good but it, it'll only take me so far it will it will only do so much for me especially now that we're looking at epigenetics it teaches you yeah the the main stimulation and i think if you go back to the core of jesus's message that's what he was trying to show it's not out here around you and what you can do to the elements or have the elements do to you. It's what's going on in here and you express out and it affects everything else around you. To me, waiting for external stimulation teaches me to be reactive. But when I go the other way and I use internal stimulation, yeah. then I become more responsive instead of reactive. And that will teach us to be more creative. For me, right. it teaches me to be more creative. Yes. I understand what you're saying, and I agree. I need this external stimulation. I can't sure. live without it. I need it every day. 
But you'd be lost without I'd her. Be lost without it. You know right? that, don't you? right? Yeah. yeah. You understand that? I understand that clearly. <laughs> but I realize it's me that has defined that and said I can't live without her. Right. It's not her. It's yeah. me that says I have to have this in my life. Yeah. And when we quit looking at it like, well, it's because of her that I am. No, it's because of who you are that this becomes important. That's right. Reverse it. Become responsive instead of reactive. Yes. The, it allows you to be more creative. That's good. That's good. Amen. You know, I was thinking about the whole concept of St. John 16. Jesus, um, he said that a woman, she has much pain, agony to deliver her child. And he said once the man child is born, she remembers no more the agony because of the joy that a man child is born. And when I read that, I used to read it and I'd say, yeah, that's, that's right, that's right. You know, and, but I guarantee you all three of these women in here have had babies. <laughs> and if you ask them, they will totally remember the pain <laughs> of having those babies. It's not like they forgot it. But the joy of having the baby overcomes the hurt and the pain and the agony of going through having it. So the joy, they, they are willing to accept the pain to have the new life. And that's what we're talking about. Is it's, it's, uh, it's like over in the book of Revelations. It said, we will remember no more the former things. When we go into the new heaven and the new earth, and I'd read that, and I'd think, well, if that's the truth, if it's just the truth the way it reads, why did we even go through this if we're not going to remember any of it? Um, we're going to remember everything, every little detail, but the issue is going to be we're going to relate it to revelation and how I learned in my life, how I was blessed in my life, the understanding of water the understanding of trees, the understanding of humans, the understanding of animals. It's all a great thing that I'm going to learn in my life. And for me to just say, now I'm going to throw all that away, and I don't want to remember any of it, and I want to go to a new earth, well, that's, that's silly. That's not what John was trying to express. And that's what we're talking about is as you come through, you will have a lot of pain and agony, but you are delivering exactly what you're supposed to deliver. You are bringing forth what is supposed to be in your life, and that is a man-child, Christ himself, living in you. The value of the experience. It's not the outcome. It's not the understanding. We need that. That's right. But all that is is another it's, doorway to another evolution. That's right. It's the actual value of the experience that we carry with us. That's, uh, that's precious to us. Right, right, right. And now here, uh, we come here with amnesia. We stay here with amnesia. You think you're waking up? You are. But keep in mind, you are <laughs> limited because I can prove it by science where it says your brain is only 10% of it's used. Why? You're not here to open up everything at one time. It's, it's not meant to be that way. There will be a certain... But when this is all over with and that's lifted, yeah. all of the remembrance, those things will become so precious to us. Amen. They'll become so valuable to us because of every little thing we went through. Amen. Yes. And did you know some of the newer scientists that are really great, um, I can't think of all their names, Dyer and, and uh, Lipton and different ones that are really great they have come to the point they said they can they can prove by scanning that we actually use 100% of our brain now years ago generation ago they did not because there wasn't we've expanded until we have to use every part of our brain now and i like that because what it does it gives us more of an open field learn more react respond, understand, take in the lessons, take in the blessings, and it just keeps, it's, uh, they, they said what it does is it rejuvenates the body, and that's why, you know, used to be 
some countries had a 45-year uh, living span. Others had 50 and 60. I think the United States right now is 71. It's the average living span. But they said within the next 30 to 40 years, it's going to be at, back up to 100, 120, and 130 um, because of the expansion of the brain, and it's making us use more of ourselves in the body. That's also a chemical thing. Yes. What we do with the elements around us and how we put them in our body will develop that. That's right. And the people who tune into that more will have a better clarity. They'll be less static. Yes. And more of a clear frequency. There'll be other ones that just go the opposite way. And because of it, the capacity is there. This right here is a big capacity with the Internet on here. That's right. But if I don't ever learn how to use it, it yeah. ain't doing me no that's right. good. That's right. And that's where we're at. See, I see what you're saying. The potential for the 100% is there. there. But now what are we going to do with that potential? Yes. Because there will be ones that pick it up and take it. I guarantee you where we're at 4,000 years from now <laughs> will be way yeah. further than, yeah. than Adam even thought we'd get. It's like Brother Branham said. He said uh, a person can have a million dollars in their pocket, and if they don't know it's there, what good is it to them? And that's exactly what we're saying is you can have all this availability, but if you don't use it and express it, then you're not going to bodily progress the way you should. Yeah. There's... Question. In other words, a person elects, choose his and hers needs or wants? A person chooses his or hers needs or wants. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's true. That's very true. Um, a person, through the choices you make, you build your path. Mm -hmm. And a, the, the path is not a, a road you go down. Uh, to me, the path is life, yeah. and um, you build your path or you build your life, and then everything you built into your life is going to keep coming back to you. Like I think one of the prophets said, cast your bread upon the water. It won't return void. Something is going to happen in your path by the choices, needs, and wants that you have. Right. Yeah. Amen. I had uh, a question here. As we move through eternity, will we know everyone in eternity personally? <laughs> and <laughs> if you need to know that person, you will know that person. If you have a need for something and that person in eternity can fulfill that need or help you fulfill that need, then yeah, you'll meet them. Yeah. If there's not a need, what's the point? I mean, just to walk by and say hi? I mean, that's right. Both. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I had uh, Brother Daryl and I, you know, when we go to the farm, we just talk about everything and a lot of these things. And I always loved talking to him, but he said, uh, he said, who will we know over there? You know, when we step over there on the other side, what, uh, what good was all this if we still don't... Uh, if we don't know who we know here. And I said, Brother Darrell, you're right. I said, you're here with Denise and Jacob and Josiah and, your, and the rest of your family. Why do you think you all gathered here together? I said, because you were all there in the theophany realm together. That's why you gathered here. That's why you, Chris is with you and this one and that one and Aubrey and, and you got your children. That's why they're with you here. Because they were with you there. And so is Denise going to be in some other uh, part of the world and never be with Daryl and Josiah and Jacob again? No. You were in Theophany together. You're in the earth together. And you're going to stay in the earth together when we move past these veils. And the people that you're with now, you will know then, and you will understand then. And, yes, you're going to know more. But let me ask you this question. 
why would Dom Parnell, why would a Tory need to know the guy that's in Raleigh, South Carolina 200 years ago who was, uh, who was a carpenter? Why would I ever need to know him? So, no, you won't necessarily know everybody, but if you need to, you will. That's right. A desire, um, you will. It'll happen. But no, you won't necessarily know every person in eternity. Uh, as we go through, we're going to go through more worlds. We're going to go through more things. We're going to pass through other experiences, and you're going to get to know more and more and more. And just remember that all those you're here with now, you were with before, and you'll be with again. thought it all comes back to the nature too you can change your nature i believe it 100 percent. every sure. single day i get up with a different nature i've added to or taken away from the nature i had the day before and i'm a different nature i may be similar but i am transforming okay N knowing that that i have a certain nature there's going to be something within me within that nature that pulls at certain things in other natures. Amen. In other words, I can identify with other parts of other natures, and that's going to draw me to the to expression them. of that nature, which is people, individuals. That's right. So I would love to sit down and talk to Tesla. I yes. mean, the things that this guy understood so my desire is someday i would like to sit down with him but i still have the same yes. desire to sit down with a few of the indian chiefs too yes. that were great and they never had all that technology but look at the wisdom so there's something in my Absolutely. nature that says i'd like to sit down with this nature who came at a different time and talk to him yes. about what they went through so i i think there is a certain ask we're all connected to the spirit but yet, we all have natures, and where you're transcending your nature to has a lot to do with who you're going to connect with That's true. from here out, Amen. I think. For me, I have always, uh, it's just in my nature, I've always been for the underdog. The, they call it the little guy. I've always been, uh, I've wanted, have you ever watched that cartoon, Underdog? <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I was always for the underdog. Um, so, like you said, you want to sit down with some of those chiefs and prophets and different things. And in my mind, I'm thinking I'd love to sit down with Pharaoh, Cain, Judas, um, you know, those men who were uh, Esau, and hear the other side of the story. Why did you do this? What was your thinking? And learn and get some understanding from them because I'm sure that Pharaoh, just think about this guy for a second. He was doing everything for his nation. He was doing everything. Pharaoh was almost like a Trump. Egypt first. We're gonna, Egypt's going to be first, and that's going to be it. It's M-A-G-A. Um, it's Egypt first, and Pharaoh was that way. And when Moses came back into Egypt, Pharaoh was just trying to, to solidify his traditions, his love for the nation, his religions, everything that he was doing. He was doing it all with, like I said months ago, everything comes out of love. It might be distorted a little. It might be slanted a little, but... Pharaoh loved these people, and I'd like to, I would just like to hear, Judas, what exactly how did you come to the understanding that Jesus was a Messiah, but he needed to be crucified to become what, he, what you wanted him to be? And I'm sure that Judas had some real thoughts in his mind about how he was going to accomplish this. He thought about it his whole three and a half years, I'm sure, because he knew the priests. He knew the military leaders. He knew all the guys to get in contact with to do these things. And 
I am sure that Judas was thinking, if I pit Jesus against Rome, I've already seen Jesus raise the dead, cast out devils, heal the sick. I've seen him do so much, I know he can put Rome down. I know we can take the kingdom. And Judas did not put him in that position to kill him. In his mind, he put him in that position to raise him to the throne. And I would just like to hear his thoughts. And I'm, I'm like you, I... I I want to know. I want to understand. I want to I want to be with people. And and understand. Uh, brother's asking a question on the passage of 1 Peter 3 verse 19. And you, you may need your Bible for this. I mean, you, I know you're a walking Bible, but you <laughs> <laughs> um, what he says is, love bless you all, precious brothers and sisters all over the world. Please, our precious brother, Atori, I want to understand more better for this passage of the scripture, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, what happened to those souls after. Thanks. Okay. So. And, and I'm pretty sure that's where it talks about Jesus going into the souls in prison. And, um, you know, I don't have my Bible right in front of me, but I'm, I'm almost positive that's it. It's where um, he said, you know, when Jesus was crucified, he entered um, into hell to the souls imprisoned. And, and um, if, you, if you take that thought, let's think about all the way back to Adam. Now, Jesus, remember, I said he was going to remove the illusionary sin. So this sin laid all the way down through here. They, they, Moses and every one of them and Balaam and they all had their sacrifices they all had their ways and they come all the way down to Jesus and then Jesus dies on Calvary and it reads when you read it it's like he left from here and he went down into the center of the earth into hell and down there in hell he met the devil and he'd done all this and you've heard all those stories in a burning fireplace and he took all the saints out and left all the others there. Well, let's think about that. Where did hell begin? <laughs> all the way back here in Genesis 3. That's where hell began. Genesis 1 and 2, Adam and Eve were living in a great, great time, the Garden of Eden, and there was no illusion of sin. There was none of those things. And then they hit Genesis 3. They stepped out. They began to come into the iniquity of humanity hell is just the iniquity of humanity that's all it is hell is a place of unrest and when humanity is in unrest it's in hell so jesus when he went into the souls in prison it wasn't that he went into this uh horrid jailhouse where all the souls in prison were he come all the way back here it said he preached to those in the days of noah jesus come all the way back and he revealed to all of them, all the way up from Adam, all the way up to his time, who he was. And as he revealed who he was, they weren't somewhere burning in a hell. They weren't somewhere, uh, all of those things. They were in their own minds. They died thinking they weren't good enough. So they weren't good enough. And wherever they went, they were held under that mindset until Jesus changed that mindset. And Jesus changed the mindset, and all of those saints rose up higher or set themselves free and said, we're free. We understand who we are now. So those saints, some of them, it said that they seen them entering the holy city. And everybody said, oh, wow. There's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they was walking around in Jerusalem over there. That, oh, that's the city that just crucified our Lord. That wasn't no holy city. The holy city where they seen the saints entering, they seen them entering into their understanding of who they were, and they entered into what Abraham wanted all the time, and that was the rest, the Holy Spirit. They broke out of their mindset of hell and entered into heaven. 
And if someone couldn't break out of that mindset of hell by accepting Christ and what he did, they stayed in their illusion until they can get out of their illusion. Because I believe when we leave here, we're going to go exactly where we think we're going to go. <laughs> and when we get there, now what's going to happen? Some of us are going to be in a great place because we know we're going there. And we're going to be, we're going to move on from there. And some of us are going to enter into, into unrest, misunderstanding, condemnation, and we're going to go right there. We're going to lay in that mindset, burning in that mindset, not a natural fire, but just burning in that unrest of, oh, no. Do I? And they're going to have to work themselves out of there. They're going to have to work themselves out of there and come out of their hell through the revelation the same way we did. We just came out of our hell here. Some will have to come out of their hell over there. And as soon as they work themselves through the process, they won't have that anymore. Some will complete that right here. That's right. And some, it'll take two or three more lifetimes before they reach that sure. point where hell no longer exists for them. They're not in hell anymore. They're sinless, and they realize that, and hell's no longer there. That's right. But it'll take them a while. I know people like oh, yeah. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're already anticipating the bondage of the next life. And they'll have to go through that. And how they'll last, I yeah. don't know. We don't know. A that. lot of times you'll hear that on cowboys and westerns, you, um, you know, you're going to hell. Says, I'll meet you there. You know. <laughs> and uh, he'll be waiting for you. I think Josie Wells, they said, they said uh, you know, uh, hound Josie Wells all the way to hell. And uh, then uh, Fletcher said, he'll be there waiting for you. <laughs> so hell is real right here. It's, it's real in the mind. And everyone is going to break out of it. There is no eternal hell. Everyone is going to break out of it. It's just a space of time. You can define hell is being limited, and heaven is limitless. You yes. can define them that way. Sure. Because once you break out of that, once you see that, nothing will limit you. There'll be no bondage on you anymore. Once you understand you're limitless, there's nothing that can take you down. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I can hear someone thinking, well, how do you tie that into... The parable Jesus talked about the rich young ruler that died, went to hell, and begged for, you know, his brothers and sisters to be. Yeah. Okay. You know which one I'm talking about? Sure. Okay, so how do yeah. you tie that in? I know somebody's thinking. I can feel it. Yeah. I think it's, it's in the book of Luke. I can't remember the chat. I think it's like 18, somewhere in there. But, but anyway, um, first thing, it was a parable. Um, it wasn't a real situation. Jesus was speaking a parable about things. And as Jesus was speaking the parable, Lazarus was in the bosom of the father, Abraham, and the rich young ruler was in hell. Now listen to what the rich young ru ruler says. He says, he starts talking about memory. And he says, I remember this and that. Could you go back and talk to my father or talk to my brothers and different ones and then he says i am set on fire of this hell and he says he says can you give me just a little water to put it on my tongue and he so he sees with his natural eyes he tastes with his natural mouth he hears with his natural ears hell's right here jesus was explaining a parable that goes on every day right here where where People who need help are not getting the help, and there are people who, ha who have all the help they could give and won't give it. And one is sitting in hell, and the other is resting in the bosom of the Father. You'll find out most of the time that the poor people are the ones that give the most because they know what it is to be poor. They know, And when they have a little extra, they'll hand it out. Whatever it might be, whether it's food or clothing or, 
or money or whatever it is, they'll help somebody else, whereas this group over here, the rich young ruler, all they were thinking about is how big their barns could be, how big all this everything, you know. And, and uh, so th the parable that Jesus was speaking about puts them in a great gulf right here. And what is our position, because we're on one side of the gulf right now, we're all in the same place. We're all in the same place. But we're on one side of the gulf, and there are those who have not been awakened that are on the other side. And we have to bring them or help them wake up out of their hell and come over. That's what Jesus did when he went into hell. He helped wake up those who could wake up through him, and then others would wake up through Paul and Irenaeus and Martin and Columba and Luther and Wesley and Branham. Others, you know, just on and on and on. But everything will wake up at some point. There is no eternal hell. Purpose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Should I start yeah, over you again? Yeah. Or do, do Here, let me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question. Talk to the bad guys. Means they were wearing mask, a persona, uh, the sound of his mask. Uh, in, and in reality, they, we are all fulfilling our earthly purpose, right? Even when it looks bad. And in other words, it sounds like he's asking the question yeah. that even when we're wearing something, a mask, something that's temporary and, and even defined as bad, it's fulfilling a purpose. That's right. And, and he's right. It is a facade or a mask or I like better to call it a nature that you step into. It's, it is a mask, it is a facade, but it's a nature you step into. And I've used him a lot, and people get upset when I use him, but let's look at Hitler. What, and it's because he caused such an atrocity in a most recent generation that I use him a lot, because we can relate. Right. Now, Hitler, when he did what he did, you, did you know Hitler did that out of love? He loved Germany. And the bankers and the politicians and everyone was taking over Germany. And he loved Germany. And he acted out of love and he began to purge out of Germany all those that he thought, through Luther's message, he thought they were bad people. Antichrist. Anti he said the Jew is Antichrist. So he began to purge them all out. And he began to purge them out of Europe, out of Poland, and out of this one. And it was, it was a situation that when we look at it in the natural, it's an atrocity. It is a, it's a genocide. It's a horrible thing. But at the same time, it fulfilled the Scripture. And Brother Branham in one place, and Isaiah in one place, even said it was the tender, loving hand of the Lord that did that. Now, was Hitler the tender, loving hand of the Lord and going to go to, quote, hell and be exterminated and be annihilated for how? Why would that be when he'd done exactly what the Spirit wanted him to do? So I look at him and I say, I thank the Lord I wasn't that guy. <laughs> I just thank my Spirit I wasn't that guy, but. That guy was doing exactly, moving in the flow of the Spirit to push those Jews into their homeland, to create a situation so that it could be the end of the Second Testament. he done all those things, and, and he helped end the Second Testament almost as much as William Branham did. So I, I see these things as they were wearing a nature, they were wearing a mask, when they step back out of the earth, 
I say out of the earth, when they go into their other realms, the facade, the mask, the nature isn't needed anymore, and they're out of it, and we look at it more like, man, you really, you really done a job. You had me convinced of, and, and, it, and we're all doing it for the betterment and for the purpose of learning what we need to learn as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needed to learn these things. Um, question, Jesus brought heaven on earth, so shall we, by our understanding. It's a question, are we, like him, by our understanding, supposed to bring about heaven on earth? I yes. guess that's his question. Yes. And, go ahead. Um, I like, first of all, I want to kind of, because this ties in with this, I want to go back. You said this in a very well way. When you look at a mask, Everybody sees the same thing. Somebody can put on a mask, and no matter where you're at in the room, when you look at it, you're going to see that same mask. But with a nature, That's right. with a nature, that person sitting over there with that nature, every person in that room, will. Per, that nature is a matter of perception. And what that's projecting is a matter of individual perception. For one person, that nature is just right. It's perfect. It's, perfect. it's what they need. With other people, it's the devil incarnate. It's no the lie. worst thing ever yes. possible. Yes. You see what I'm saying? So it is a nature, but understand, a nature continually changes it never stays the same so what you have to do is when you're watching a nature you have to understand that that nature is in the process of transforming while you're watching it it's not going to stay exactly the same that's right it's going to transform so you have to transform or progress your thinking along with that nature and then you can determine whether you want to attach yourself to it and work with it or separate yourself from it and Amen. go a different direction. Amen. And with him bringing up this point about heaven on earth. It's a nature. It's a nature. Jesus, with his nature, he brought about heaven on earth. But for a lot of people, he brought hell on earth. There's a lot of people yes. that hated him with a passion. And to them, he was like, the way in politics today, people look at Donald Trump, they hated him. They hated him with yes. a passion. He was the devil incarnate. For other people, he was bringing heaven on there. So it is that question in answering it myself, I would say it's a matter of your own perception. That's, that's true. It's a matter of your own perception. I can see, I've said it a thousand times, but I was an HR director. I was a negotiator. And when I saved a plant, they all loved me. When I had to shut down a plant, they all hated me. I was the same person, but they perceived me in one mask as being a low life, no good, SOB, because you shut down our plant. And the other said, you're the greatest man. You came in here. You saved us. You, you made this place make money. I can take my children to school. I can send them to college. <laughs> I can put food on my table. You've done so much for me. And I had people tell me that. And I had other people tell me, you got a target on your back. Don't be surprised if it doesn't get shot. And I had them tell me that. So it's a perception and a nature. Hitler, you know what he did? Just go back and read history. He promised everybody, Josiah, he promised everybody who would join the military, as soon as we are finished with this war, you got a free Volkswagen. Oh, man, people was joining the military by the hundreds and thousands because that's why in 1947 and 48 and 49, Volkswagens flooded the whole world because they were making Volkswagens like mad, and then Hitler lost the war, and they couldn't, they weren't going to give everybody a Volkswagen in the military, so they began to send them out all over the world, and that's how... Volkswagen become such a big thing because it worked off of a promise from Hitler. And you know those people said, great, yeah, let's join, let's do this. Let's. They loved him. 
But the Jews didn't love him so much. <laughs> it's perception. So the mask is, you can use that and say that if you want. You can use facade if you want. But really, it's a nature that you put on. And when you're finished with that nature, it'll change. You'll move on to the next. One more, and then we'll close. But here's, uh, this is a good one. I liked it when it came in to me. And it was, we often talk about Jesus. We are his body now. And I believe that. Will he have a personal body again, one like ours, and walk around with us when we set up in the new earth, or will he just be a spirit? I like that question because a lot of people say that Don Parnell does not believe that Jesus will ever have a body again. He put it into the cosmos. We're going to be new heaven, new earth. We're all going to be there. And Jesus is going to be there just like us. He's going to have a body just like us. The pillar of fire is the one that he doesn't, uh, where, if you want to call it, a natural body all the time. He can put it on like Melchizedek if he wants, but he doesn't wear it all the time. And he can spread himself out among us, and he can be a part in us, and he can pull us for natures that he wants to bring out of himself, pull us and do it. He can do all of those things. But the pillar of fire, you remember in the future home, Brother Branham said, the pillar of fire would be hanging there, and it would flood down through the whole city and out into the earth. And he said, Jesus would be sitting there on the throne. And I used to think, Brother Branham, you believe in two or three. No, he's just saying that Jesus will have a literal, natural body right there with us, and he'll be moving about the earth just like we do and enjoying the fellowship and at the same time, just like he does in you, the pillar of fire sets right up here, and it flows throughout the whole body. And that is our new heaven and our new earth. That is our future home that each one of us, he said, the pillar of fire hang there, Jesus will be sitting there, and it will flood and come through the whole earth. Well, I can say the same thing about me. I can say the same thing about Daniel, Denise, Josiah, Connie, Patty. I can say it about Jacob, Daryl. All of us will have the pillar of fire hanging over us right here. It's a, it'll be in us, and we will have a natural body fellowshipping throughout the whole earth. So, yes, he will have a natural body. You might not see him every day. <laughs> you might not see him every year. But he'll be moving about in fellowship just like he was on the shores of Galilee and the Logos will be in every one of us. I think that's uh, it's probably it's 1244. Was there another question there? Okay. Yes, Brother Adigbo. Um Remember me and my beloved wife in prayer for her back pain and also my knee pain. Thank you. Yes. And we also want to remember Sister Golden Parsons, Golden, Golden Baldwin Parsons. And um, we want to remember all the people. There are several different ones I've seen that are asking for prayer on Facebook. Remember all of those. And I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and close on that. It's almost quarter quarter till uh, one and I hope this has been a blessing I'm going to do this a little more often we'll have subjects you know and we'll have presentations but we'll also do this some because it helps the people get a little better flow of the common things um, we're not trying to do away with natural bodies we're not trying to do away with the resurrection the resurrection I'm only I'm we are only placing the resurrection in a different way. We're placing 
the rapture in a different way. It's an awakening. We're placing, we're placing uh, the earth in a different way. We're placing things in a different way than what you have had them placed before. I'm not trying to take away any of the things. I'm not trying to take away hell. We're placing hell in its right position. We're placing heaven in its right position. We're placing the church ages in its right position. We're placing William Branham in his right position. We're doing all of that. So um, as we go through this, we'll come back and we'll pick some of these up. There are some other really great questions here. Will, uh, will there be people in the kingdom that will be working in contrast, unison with us, then after we move? And uh, can we talk some about this? So we'll talk about this maybe next week or whenever. But will there be people who will be in contrast to us? Um, will there be tares there? Will there be people who, who don't believe you have what you have? And will there be all of this? Well, you know, the kingdom of the Lord is here now. Is it here now? <laughs> it will probably be here then. then. <laughs> so we'll go through these. Can we discuss what is meant by equality are we equal i want to say this there's only one i didn't read anywhere in the bible where it said we're equal i didn't read anywhere in the prophets where it said we're equal the only place i read about equality was in the united states government the declaration of independence <laughs> so uh We'll talk about that. Are we equal? Will there be people in eternity that have or receive more than others based on awards and blessings? Um, so we'll talk about it. What is it like when you die, when death comes to your door? So we'll talk on those things and enjoy them. I just want to say this, and I'm not getting on to anybody. Don't. I know I'm kind of different, so don't take this personally against you. But I notice the nature of a lot of these questions all tie back to religion. That's right. I challenge everyone to sound on my voice. When you present a question, look at your life. Talk about your life here and now. Not 2,000 years ago, not 2,000 years in the future. Talk about your life here and now yeah. and the relevancy of what is going on around us and how it affects our life right here and now. That will be worth more to you than yes. figuring out everything that happens on the other side. That's right. Or figuring out everything that happened in the, in the past and being able to place it in the right place. Yes. All of that is, is mundane compared to one thought present right here, here and now Amen. get your questions about your life here and now because every day you wake yes. up you're not living for next month or next year you're living for that day That's right. present your questions the same way look at your life and say how can i sit around and talk to somebody about my yeah. life and i have questions yeah. do that try to eliminate the other stuff from it and you'll Amen. find they'll become more personal and when you get answers those answers will help you more jesus sat down read isaiah 61 and what they didn't like what they hated was he took isaiah 61 and put it right in him and he said you know i'm anointed of the lord i'm the one that's come i'm the messiah i'm this i'm that and then the scripture says Jesus read it and said, this day, this day, not tomorrow, not yesterday, this day, this scripture is fulfilled, and he sat down, just 